Hello, I'm with David Bynes, a professor of economics at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Balliol College. David, thank you for joining Hi. us. Um, I'm going to start by asking a slightly mischievous question. I know you've done a lot of work on um, uh, economic governance in the, the European Monetary Union. You've written extensively about that. And my response is um, economic governance in the European Monetary Union. Isn't that a bit of an oxymoron? <laughs> It's, but it's necessary. <laughs> uh, uh, if you want to say the monetary union is an oxymoron, we'll go right there. Uh, a lot of us have been thinking about what's necessary to make this, this monetary union work. And a lot of people now are fundamentally very pessimistic about whether it will survive the next five or ten years. And where uh, do you stand on that? Uh, I'm now pessimistic. And uh, I'm by nature an optimist, but I think it is a, let, let's be centrally clear about this. Mm -hmm. the, running a monetary union involves obligations of, on the, the peripheral countries in the south and on Germany of, of an important kind. And let me explain to you. My work is on macroeconomic management and on the progress that we've made in advanced Western countries since the 1970s. I grew up in that chaos of the 70s. Uh, we now know a lot about how to manage macroeconomies until the crisis. We'd done that well. But he, within the European Monetary Union, there was a very, very big risk. And the risk was once you have a, a central in setting of monetary policy, the same interest rate in all countries. Those in the periphery uh, who became, in the early 2000s, much more competitive, began to grow fast, began to have inflation, and that caused them to have lower real interest rates than everywhere else. And Germany, the opposite, was growing less, slowly, less quickly, uh, the great uh, consolidation that the Germans did, higher real interest rates in Germany, causing the growth to keep on being slow there and causing the boom to keep on being fast in the south where interest rates were lower. Same num money interest rate, but inflation in the south means the real cost of borrowing is less, and in Germany the real cost of borrowing was more. So the, 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 the premise, uh, and I remember that this was, uh, I think, uh, the, the central premise that uh, advocates of the euro for the UK made, Willem Boiter uh, was amongst them. The argument was that um, the longer that all of these countries are yoked together under a common monetary policy, the more likely uh, there is to be convergence. But in fact, it looks like the opposite has happened. That's true. And I was not uh, with Willem. I saw this as a risky monetary union, which it would not be in the interests of Britain to join. And th I, I, but I think it's an ambition of great importance for Europe to build something of a monetary union. But when you do big things, you have to do them responsibly and understanding what you're doing. What it required is because there was a common monetary policy, and in the way I've described, not this convergence, you needed to understand the use of fiscal policy. Very unfashionable in the 1990s and mm -hmm. 2000s, but necessary in a monetary union. And it, and it, and it seems actually to, to get onto the question of fiscal policy that that was constrained right away by the uh, uh, creation by the Germans of the Stability and Growth Pact. Um, I have never seen anything in the, the economics literature which would give a rationale for the 60% public debt to GDP ratio and the 3% annual deficits to GDP ratio that were uh, drawn up. In fact, um, there are articles uh, recently in the French press saying that the 3% number was just picked out of the air by the, uh, the French ministry to evoke the Holy Trinity. <laughs> You're right. And, and uh, the German attitude to fiscal policy is col colored by their past. What you have with fiscal policy is the opposite uh, is the opportunity for extravagance and spending, and the task of policy is to pin this down. And it didn't matter whether sixty percent was arbitrary as long as you had a rule. And people like me standing on the side said, "Well, you know, we've brought up children, and and uh, we've learned 
that imposing a rigid rule on your children, which won't work, then when the rule's gone and your children look at you and say, what now? You say, well, I just do rules. And they yep. say, well, you've broken your rule. What now? Yes. And that's what the position of this rigid rule in Europe has led to. No clear understanding of how to use fiscal policy in response to the kind of crisis we've had. And of course, you could argue that in, in many respects, you couldn't use fiscal policy on the supranational scale because, of course, you didn't have a, a, a European a, wide, a Euro wide treasury. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, of course, what many would argue is the core uh, institutional weakness, which it may have been recognized at the start, but it wasn't really openly acknowledged. It was very unfashionable. Well, anyway, we go know. back to your oxymoron at yeah. the beginning <laughs> uh, that uh, if you're going to build a monetary union, you have to recognize what you need to do. And, and it was necessary to recognize that you would need fiscal policy to do this. And of course, uh, Germany and others would say, and that o opens you up to risk, moral hazard, rip off, the whole worry. And you've got to build the institutional structure and the trust that will allow you to do what's necessary. Of, of course, the, the, the Germans uh, um, were amongst the most enthusiastic proponents of the, uh, the so-called federal model before the, 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 the troubles mm, arose. Mm. This is a more interesting revision that they've had now, now that they perceive it as being a, an endless call on the German taxpayer. I grew up in Australia, which is a successful federal structure, and I recall very vividly the, the financial crisis in, in Victoria and South Australia in the early 1990s, big property boom crash, mm -hmm. and bank failure. And contrast the German behaviour towards Greece with the Australians. They did not say to people who lived in Victoria, you're a bunch of penguins, you don't know how to live properly, go off to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. They said, we belong to Australia, and this is a common life, and our job is to ensure you. And they did. And they made completely certain that this was not a long-run transfer union. They said, this is insurance policy. We're helping resolve this problem. This will not happen again. Uh, but now we, we, it's our task to insure. But even and, if it and, and, and that's what we should have been seeing. The, Germ the, the Greek problem could have been solved for what looked like, looks like no money now. Yes. Uh, but a year of laughing at the Greeks for being irresponsible cost the European Monetary Union probably half a trillion euros. Uh, now, big, yeah. <laughs> big laugh for half a trillion is a it, sheet that responsibility to German irresponsibility. And, and, and I, as you say, there, there is, a, of course, a, in Australia, a sense of nationhood. So, and it's the same thing in Canada. Mm. Uh, uh, you mm. know, we, we, uh, I'm Canadian by birth, and, and, and we have for uh, decades had equalization payments. And of course, uh, even that, though... That's to go one stage further. That's yes. a real transfer union. And I can imagine Germans saying it's not our task to... Do, a lot of poor people in the South, uh, I know all about global poverty, but it's not my responsibility to help bring forward growth in the South. There's a limit to that. I'm talking about something um, less than that, insuring against crisis and risk. The, the, it is, there is a limit, and of course, the, the Germans themselves uh, experienced it directly because there, there was this massive fiscal transfer from uh, from uh, west to east, and then in of the course, Marshall Plan. The, yes, and uh, even, uh, we do, do you well, mean like well, 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 no, the, the reunification with the Marshall Plan as well? Yes. Actually, I mean, there was this, it was the yes. same sort of thing actually, and I, and, and I, I guess the other point is that if you have a, a so-called United States of Europe then this whole question about trade imbalances goes away again. So to go back to your Australian example. Um, it wouldn't matter, for example, it doesn't matter, or I don't think people even know, whether, say, New South Wales runs a current account surplus with the, with the, the other uh, four states, or, even, or Western mm. Australia. Mm. It's just not a relevant consideration. And, 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 and likewise, in the US, we don't really care if California runs a current account surplus vis-a-vis -vis the other 49 states. That's because you're really confident that it will survive. Yes. And until 2008, there was no risk premium on Greek debt or Spanish debt because everyone was confident that the union would survive and there was no worry about current account deficits with the South. But 
you suddenly realise there's a risk. And, and when there's a risk, they might leave. Oh dear. What's more, their banks are exp if they, all this bank debt, their banks are exposed. And who guarantees the banks? Uh, another great failing, we have no banking union, mm -hmm. so their own state is all that's to guarantee the banks. So we then got a uh, risk of currency, risk of banking collapse, risk of government collapse. And all of a sudden, then imbalance between the countries really matters. And then, of course, you've got to, to extend the Australian analogy even further. If we had a banking crisis, as we did in Victoria State in the 1990s, you would have had a real problem if, for example, the state of Victoria uh, would have been forced to yeah. issue guarantees for the entire, uh, say, the Commonwealth uh, the banking, uh, Commonwealth Bank's deposit base, um, without any support from the, the National Treasury. I mean, that would and have the cost National Treasury took over that yeah, bank. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what, to take Cyprus, would have solved the Cyprus problem for very little. And it's got to be, cl you've got to be clear, this looks difficult for Germany. Uh, but again, I come back to responsibility. Creating a monetary union involves opportunities for the, uh, the periphery, the South. It involves responsibilities for them not being indisciplined. For Germany, we've been talking only about the responsibilities, but the central opportunity which they've taken is to create a, a competitive Germany within a wider Europe, which has advanced Germany's, Germany's interests. Well, absolutely, and, in fact. And, 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 and when you get in a structure uh, something really pays off, it's also important to accept the responsibility that goes with it. And, and, and we have to go on saying that. And, and that's an important point to remind the Germans of, because, of course, they keep talking about cost, cost, cost. But in, right. in, in fact, um, you could make the point that um, currency union has allowed them achieve, to achieve what um, two world wars fa uh, f failed to allow them to achieve, namely the economic and political dominance of Europe. <laughs> you wait. If you were as pessimistic as, as I am, sadly, you would worry that this might turn in the next five, ten years into th Germany's third missed opportunity. Yes. And that's a very sad... It's frightening for, for all of us, but it's, but it's also very sad for Germany that, to be given again this chance to lead Europe well and to not understand how to do the politics of leading Europe well in this way. And one can sympathize in some respects because, of course, you could argue that they'd never been in a position where they'd been forced to exercise this global leadership before. And in a sense, the country was divided after the Second mm -hmm. World War. They, the West operated largely under the tutelage of the Americans. The East, of course, uh, tutelage is not the right word, the colonization of, of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, so they've really only had a comparatively limited time as an independent national country. And I don't think they've had this uh, sense of, 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 of the broader leadership. international responsibilities. Yeah. It's the topic of the book which I've just finished with Peter Temin from MIT called The Leaderless Economy and its central story is how the late 19th century, a wonderful period of global progress led by Britain, disintegrated with the First World War and created a, a Europe and a world which no one knew how to lead. The British could no longer lead after the First World War and, and Germany and the US for different reasons couldn't. And the great contrast is the wonderful period after the Second World War when, as you said, uh, the Marshall Plan was central in leading the world. And we need that sense. Now we're in a world where leadership is passing, in your, has passed very importantly to Germany and in the wider world to China and this requires not just discipline but leadership to create the opportunities for growth. As you say we've got the two choices, uh, the positive and the negative uh, and, and, and one hopes that uh, the, the lessons of both world wars will be absorbed properly and then we'll take the right one. That's the ambition, <laughs> yes. David, yes. Um, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us, it's uh, been most enlightening and uh, I'm sure our viewers will appreciate it. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. Good.